So now in our study of dependent arising, we're going to look at consciousness and name and form, and they have a special reciprocal relationship. They are the center of the vortex of becoming. Namaste. So name and form, name and form. Why is name and form considered so important in the Buddha's teaching? Well, I want to bring up a verse that I first quoted way back in 2013 on this channel. Akheya sanyino sata, akheya smi patiteha, akheya aparinyaya, yogam ayanti machuno. Beings are conscious of what can be named. They are established on the nameable. By not comprehending the nameable things, they come under the yoke of of death. Now this is a very important verse quoted again and again by Jnanananda Bhikkhu and this led me in the beginning of this channel to go deeply into ontology. I had studied an online course from the University of Oxford a graduate level course on ontology. And I also went into uh, ontology software. And this came out in our series on matrix learning. So to really understand something, you have to go deep into the terminology. You know, science, sometimes ontology is called the science of science because ontology is the science that's used to construct a science. If you have a new field of study that has never been looked at before, say you make some fundamental discovery or you merely extend existing work into some new direction, you have to make up a set of terminology to describe what it is so you can talk about it. And so you can communicate with others. And it all has to be properly defined, properly related to one another, and so on. This is ontology. And ontology is an important part of learning, precisely because of this. Because you want to be able to communicate, not only to yourself, but also to others, what you are experiencing or what you have learned. So ontology is a huge, powerful science. And it would benefit everyone to look into it. I'm not going to present here because I already did it way back in the beginning of this channel. But what does Buddha say here? Beings are conscious of what can be named, which infers that they're not conscious of what cannot be named. So if you have in your ontology, in your model of reality, in your background by which you measure and think about things, if you have a name for a certain phenomenon, then it's accessible to you. You can be conscious of it, you can think about it, you can reason about it. If you don't have a name for it, well, it's just out there in the great unknown. <laughs> and there's no real way to access that phenomenon, to bring it into consciousness, to reason with it and about it, or to develop it, in the case of meditation, for example. There is so much going on in our minds that Unless we study the Buddha's teaching, we have no real way to talk about. There's no vocabulary, no terminology. That's why last time I referred to the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. And I'm going to refer to it again with a card. 
because this is how the mind creates I. Buddha goes on to say, they are established on the nameable. Everybody is thinking, I am my name. Huh? I am Mr. So-and-so. And then we have all these designations. I'm an American, I'm white, I'm Democratic or Republican, I'm from this or that ethnic background. I'm uh, usually they talk about in terms of career, how you make your money. Huh? Um, I'm a mechanic or I'm a writer or I'm a dentist or I'm whatever. Huh? These are all names. So names are symbols that we use to define our identity. And now with identity politics, it's getting really crazy. People are identified with these different labels, including things that they just make up like woke. Huh? I mean, what does that really mean? It really means that a person identifies with certain terminology. So of course, this is simply illusion. <laughs> First of all, there is no I, but we are trying very hard to create the illusion that there is some permanent, some tangible, some real identity. So we take up all these different terms and we establish ourselves, we establish our consciousness, our values, our judgments, our feelings about things on the nameable. Some people are so hung up on this that they will only purchase certain brands of, let's say, uh, you know, perfectly ordinary things like clothing. Huh? They even have the brand emblazoned across <laughs> their clothes. And this is madness. This is nonsense. Obviously, we are not our clothes. We are not our bodies. <laughs> We're not even our consciousness. But people identify with names. But by not comprehending the nameable things, they come under the yoke of death. Why? Because a person who is identified with a name, with a symbol, with a designation, is not taking care of their spiritual life. They're not even taking the first steps, the first little baby steps in spiritual life. They're not really seeing that the being, the real part of our being, huh? Is completely separate from the illusory part, which is another way of saying that the permanent part is completely separate from the temporary. See, everything that is made, everything that is fabricated, everything that is created, everything that has a beginning also has an end. So the whole work of spiritual life is to find that which has no beginning and no end. And that is within us. Sometimes people call it God or Brahman or Tao. Huh? So many different names. But they're talking about the same thing. The same thing, the thing that never goes away. It was my creaky old chair here. The thing that is permanent, stable, reliable, firm, strong. The thing that does not die when the body dies. That is the self in the Vedic conception. Or in Buddha's conception, it's the not self. <laughs> The, the confusion is there because the Vedic term self, Atman, is used to refer to two different things. 
the personality, which is the temporary part, and the Brahman, which is the permanent part. So to avoid this confusion, Buddha says, the self, what we conceive of as self, is all perishable. It's all impermanent. And no self, emptiness, void, is the real thing. But by void or emptiness, Buddha means exactly the same thing as the Upanishads mean by Brahman. Don't get confused about it. It's just a matter of language. But the Buddha's negative terminology makes it easier to give up the false things right from the beginning. Past and future, the ego, the view of the body or the designations or symbols about the body as being the self, as being real, one's identity and so forth. These come, these come very easily uh, under the Buddha's teaching to be given up. And under the Vedic teaching, it's harder. Like I remember <laughs> when we were doing bhakti, dualistic Vedic bhakti, and how strongly identified we were with designations, with names, names of God, names of myself, huh? the name given by the guru at the time of initiation is a big deal. It's very meaningful. <laughs> well, if it's given by a real guru, it is. But what it refers to is actually something impermanent the person, the style, the actually the where the person is hung up, where that person is identified. And of course, what we're really trying to do is to transcend all these uh, identifications and reach selflessness. And the Buddha's teaching is arranged in such a way as to make that really easy, much easier than in the Vedic system. So let's look at this special relationship between consciousness and name and form. And what bhikkhus is consciousness? There are these six classes of consciousness. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, mind consciousness. This is called consciousness. So consciousness is dependently arisen. Consciousness is not absolute. What is absolute is unconditioned awareness. But unconditioned awareness does not have an object except itself. So there really isn't an object. <laughs> so people get all confused because they want to make consciousness eternal. But consciousness can't be eternal because the object of consciousness and the quality of consciousness is always changing. Every night when we go to sleep, our consciousness changes from Jagrat to Svapna and then to Sushupta. And then in the morning we wake up again. So it's always changing. And because of that, our world is always changing. So consciousness is relative. Consciousness is dependently arisen. Consciousness arises from the cause of sankhara. We've already been over that. But now we have to look at how name and form arises from consciousness. And what bhikkhus is name and form? Feeling, perception, intention, contact, attention. This is called name. The four great elements and the form derived from the four great elements. This is called form. Thus, this name and this form are together called name and form. So this is a little bit confusing. Well, what do we mean by this? Huh? Well, 
I'm going to go into this in detail in the next episode. But for today, I just want to quote uh, a very important quote from Bhikkhu Nyanananda. Name and form means a formal name and a nominal form. Form is known with the help of name. Just as feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention represent the primary notion of name, even so the four great elements form the basis for the primary notion of form. So in other words, name and form are both aggregates. They're not fundamentals. Yet name and form, together with consciousness, are the basis of the vortex that drives samsara, that drives dependent origination. It's the motor that turns the wheel of samsara. So then what? <laughs> it means that what we call name is actually a gestalt, an aggregate of feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. That is how we experience things, isn't it? And then we slap a name on that. Huh? This is my, my teacup. Huh? But if we look at it, if we really go into it, wait a minute, there's a lot more than, than just a teacup. There's a certain kind of metal, and it's shaped in a certain way, and then there's the handle, and so on and so forth. There's a lot that goes into it. But we just make a very simple name, teacup, which denotes its function. That's what Jnanananda means when he says it's a formal name. It's a formal name. It's a name that's shared with others in common and agreed upon in language. But the actual reality can be very different. It could be made of ceramic, or it could be even be made of paper, huh? a disposable teacup. So teacup can mean a great many things that have different attributes in actual experience. The only thing in common is the function. And similarly, the form. Huh? The form is a nominal form. Actually, the, the form of this metal in its original form in the earth is just a lump of, of stuff in the ground. Then it has to be taken out, refined, put through so many processes, and then formed into the shape of a cup. The form of a cup. See? The form is what gives it the function. It can be made of metal, clay, plastic, or what have you. But if it will hold tea, then it can be called a teacup. Huh? It could be an old tin can. <laughs> but if it's old tea, it'll t it's a teacup, right? So in this way, we have a formal name and a nominal form. The actual mix of elements in the form may be different, but because it serves a singular function, it gets a singular name. Now, this is just the beginning of our discussion of name and form. And in the next episode, we'll go deeper. Bulu Sarnai.